Hey, are you in the middle of summer and already starting to worry about how your kiddo is going to do back at school in the fall? Are you thinking, gosh, I don't even know what to do right now because school isn't open. I don't know how to get them prepared. I got you. I'm Shannon Penrod, and today we're going to be talking about my top 10 tips for things to do during the summer to set your kiddo and you and your family and everyone, even your kiddo's teacher, up for success in the fall. That's what we're going to be talking about today live during the show. You can interact with us. The chat is open right now. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other sites. So welcome to Autism Live. The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Hey, 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 good morning and welcome to Autism Live. As I mentioned before, we're going to be talking about the top 10 things that you can be doing right now in the dead of summer to set your kiddo up for success, set up yourself for success, set up the whole family for success so that in, when you start school in the fall, you're going to be kicking it on all gears. Uh, we're going to be talking about that all throughout the show today. I also want to say to everybody, we're on our summer schedule right now. So I really appreciate those of you that have hung in. I know it's sometimes hard to know which days we're going to be live, and we had anticipated being live yesterday with Dr. Grant Pichet, and something, I can't share what yet, but something uh, came up that she couldn't be here. She sends her regrets, but later in the week when I'm able to tell you what was going on, you'll understand why. So, uh, but I'm sending everybody a big, warm summer hug because we're in the thick of it now. It's... <laughs> We're, in fact, we're so much in the thick of summer that around here we're saying it's code orange because we're getting ready for Halloween because that you have to. And, and honestly, we're getting ready for Christmas too and the holidays because uh, we've already started working on the toy guide. I know, it's crazy how fast it all goes. But it is summer and there's a lot to be enjoyed, but there is this thing that's looming in the fall, school. And for those of you who have kids who are starting school or in school right now, I know how stressful that can be for you. Hoping and wanting it to be really successful, feeling like a loss of control because your kiddo is going to school and there's only so much you can control at school, right? In the spring, we talked about how to get the IEP together so that you, know, you would have the best possible case scenario of what was happening in the fall. Then we talked about some things to do throughout the summer to supercharge your child so that they, or your teen or your adult, so that they are learning concepts that will set them up for the fall. But now we're gonna talk about things that we start to do right now. It's not too late, it's not too early, it's the perfect time. Traven's going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us. I hope that you will. We're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. You can be writing in on any of those platforms with your questions or comments about this or about anything else. Just say hi. Tell us where you're watching from. I love that. Uh, also want to say to you that this show will be available as a podcast later on, uh, probably today and that you can free download wherever you watch your podcast. And we also have an app now, the Autism Live app. You can get that um, any place that uh, apps are available because it's on, available on both. I also want to mention that Dr. Doreen, Ask Dr. Doreen, is its own podcast now. That you, We want you to subscribe to that podcast so that you never miss an episode of that. Uh, you can visit her website and leave uh, questions and comments there so that we can answer your questions. Uh, the fabulous Marina runs that, and she's so good. She'll make sure that your question gets answered. And I believe that the Ask Dr. Doreen app is available right now on um, Apple, at the Apple Store, and soon will be available at the Google Store. So I'm sure that's not what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know what I meant by that. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we are going to run through these top 10 things really quickly for those of you who are in a hurry. And then we're going to go through them and I'm going to give you examples and talk about why it's so important. But we're going to speed through them. I'm going to hope to do this 
in less than a minute. Somebody set the clock and time me. Ready, set, go. Okay, first disclaimer, I, you know, I always like to give you guys a disclaimer that um, it's really important that we understand that small incremental changes are the thing that get it done. That's what makes the Grand Canyon, okay? So here's number one. Number one is keep a reasonable bedtime schedule. I know that this is so hard during the summer, but it's going to be key. Number two, get lots of physical activity. That's for you too, as well as your kiddos. Number three, read with your child every single day. Oh my goodness, and, and we're gonna change how we do it depending on their age and skill level. Number four, have play dates. Number five, make a fall schedule, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. Number six, hack your morning routine, and we'll talk about how you do that. Number seven, involve your child in back to school shopping. Number eight, visit the school in whatever way you can. We'll talk about why that's important. Number nine, it's stuck on me. Number nine, no, it skipped to 10. Number nine, make laminated copies of your child's IEP and BIP. I'll explain exactly why and what those things are. And number 10, do tongue twisters. And we'll talk about why that is super duper important. There's your magic 10. Good morning uh, to Autism Journey with Elijah. There's your magic 10. And now we are gonna go back to the beginning and we're gonna take this apart. We're gonna tear it right down to the ground, build it right back up. Okay, so. <laughs> These are the top 10 things to do in summer to prepare for school success in the fall. I want to make sure that I note that this is preparing everybody for success in the fall because it's not just stressful for your kiddo, it's stressful for you. It's stressful for the teacher. Um, it certainly can be stressful for your kiddo and we want to not, you know, I want to eliminate the stress, let's be honest, but that's not really practical. So let's see if we can ratchet it all the way down to a one or a two. Um, because that is practical. That's something that we can do. I want you just to, for a moment to imagine that you could be standing like this young woman looking at the Grand Canyon, arms out going, I love my life, and your child going to school. Imagine if that could be you and that could be your kiddo. That's what I want to set you guys up for success for. And we can't do that. The Grand Canyon was not made overnight. It was not. It wasn't like they, you know, boom. It, what we know is that it was drips of water over so much time. And this is, I think, one of the big keys to life that I've learned in my years that if I apply this, ooh, things go better. Small, consistent changes create success. Let me say that again. Small, consistent changes create success. It's that water droplet making the Grand Canyon. And then maybe take me out of the shot for just a second, Traven, because at the bottom of this um, screen, I heard this on the Oprah Winfrey show maybe 30 years ago. And it, I ha think about this almost every day. The equation strength over time equals power. Strength over time equals power. When my son was diagnosed with autism, I wanted everything to be okay and I wanted it to be okay right in that instant. I wanted instant results. I wanted to know that our life was going to be better, that his life was going to be better, that everything was going to be okay and I wanted instantaneous change. And what I found out was that that is not a thing, that if I wanted to help my son we needed to be on a path where we put one foot in front of the other and we consistently made small changes to help create success. Strength over time did in fact equal power. It's the same thing with getting your kiddo ready for school success in the fall. Don't make drastic changes with anything. You're gonna make little incremental changes that, and this is why right now is the ideal time to do it because we're mid-July. Most of you won't go back until mid-August or even the first week in September. So you've got plenty of time to be making little changes right now to get that child set up for success, get yourself set up for success, and potentially even get the teacher set up for success. So let's go to our number one thing, and, and this is critical. Keep a reasonable bedtime schedule. Now, if you're like me, <laughs> You know, I think one of the great luxuries in life is being able to stay up as late as you want to and then sleep as late as you want to. 
Well, that is a great luxury, but it isn't really one that we can afford while they're in school. I know, let's all have our feelings about that, right? That's a ginormous bummer. And if you're like me, you may have gotten off schedule and it's like, oh, well, it was 4th of July and we stayed up till midnight and now we're in this pattern where we stay up later than we normally do and we're not getting up early in the morning. Okay, well, forgive yourself. You lived. You lived large. That's fabulous. But now is the time to very slowly bring it back to something that's reasonable. So if your child, it, whatever, and, and by the way, this is for all ages. If you have a child who's about to be a senior in high school or if you have a child who's about to go to preschool, you're, what you're going to do is decide what is the reasonable bedtime that I want when we're going to school. What's going to set my, my child up for success? Some kids need 10 hours of sleep. Some need eight. I would tell you that if you think your child needs six hours of sleep, I would ask you to look at that again. I don't know your child, so maybe you're right. But I think sometimes we kid ourselves that six, and signs that it's not enough sleep is that your, your child is falling asleep in the classroom. I had that issue over and over and over again, uh, right? If your child is cranky at different points during the day consistently, they're just cranky with no reason, um, those are signs that they're tired and they're not getting enough sleep. And the answer, if they're school-aged, is not a nap. It isn't. Unless your child has some other physical issues, we really want to minimize the naps because we want that hard sleep during the night. So let's say that your child is 12 and you've set the bedtime and you, for your family you've said, okay, bedtime is 9.30. And then maybe, you know, you've said 9.30 but lights out at 10 because you know that your child has to be up at a certain time and you've done the math and they're going to get enough sleep. I would, I would suggest to you that in the beginning, if, if you've seen signs that your child is tired, try adding an hour and see if you can make that happen, right? But you can't add the hour all at once, right? So if you've said, okay, 9.30 is the, uh, the bedtime and they can read until 10, which means lights on until 10. It's a great buffer, by the way, to give them that half hour to be in the bed and be all cozy, right? But right now, so you said 9.30, lights out at 10 o'clock, but right now, realistically, lights are not getting out until 11.30. Forgive yourself, you're not a terrible parent, you're living your life, but now we gotta start to move the dial back to 9.30. And if you just suddenly tonight say to your child, okay, well, you're going to bed at 9.30, your life is gonna be miserable, their life is gonna be miserable, you're all gonna be up to 11.30 anyway, and there's gonna be crying and hysterics. So let's not do that, right? <laughs> Instead, if they've been going to bed at 11.30, now you're gonna move it back five or 10 minutes whatever you think your child will be able. So 11.30, now you're gonna say, okay, well, you know, lights have to be off at 11.20, and then the next night, 11.10, until you get yourself to the 9.30. Now, if you see that you're, you know, it's creating lots of histrionics, maybe you gotta move slower, maybe you do it five minutes, but you wanna be moving that dial to get as close to 9.30 before school starts as possible without upsetting the apple cart. That's what I mean about reasonable bedtime schedule and you also need to be adjusting the getting up in the morning too, right? So if, uh, if they've been getting up at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? Now you're gonna move it back 10 minutes and you're gonna get them up 10 minutes earlier. But you really gotta be charting that course to get on schedule for at least a couple of days before school starts. So even make yourself a calendar if you need to so that you can do the math and go, oh, okay, we gotta, we got a, four minutes. We got to shave four minutes off of this. And I'll tell you something. If you do four minutes, they're really not going to notice. Four minutes is negligible, but four minutes over time is hours. So keep that bedtime schedule reasonable. Make it really enjoyable when they go to bed. Make it really enjoyable when they get up in the morning. Make everybody happy, but be moving the dial in the direction that you need it moved. Okay, and here's something that's going to help you with that. Number two is get lots of physical activity. I, I have a dear friend, her kids are older now. I think they're out of college. I haven't seen her in a couple of years. I need to check in with her. But when, our, when we all, I, her kids were older than my son, but everybody talked about her two boys, how they were the nicest, most polite boys. They, they were not on the autism spectrum, right? But these boys were just, she was raising gentlemen. You know what I'm talking about? 
and um, they were and they were present and aware and whatever. And I remember one time, uh, she was a, a doula. I think is a doula. And I, but I remember somebody saying to her, "What is your secret? You you are such a good mom, and your kids are so." well adjusted and happy and and she said oh you got to run them like dogs and i remember leaning in and going what did you just say <laughs> and, and she said they need lots of activity you got to run them until their yayas are out so summer is a great time to do this and i want to say this that for a lot of our kids on the autism spectrum i sometimes am worried that they don't get as much physical activity as other kids because maybe they're doing therapy uh, or maybe they're in speech for a half hour, which they desperately, desperately need, but that's a half an hour that they missed out on the playground with the other kids. You know what I'm saying? So summer is a great time to get physically active with them. And it's not just them, it's you too. And if you have to start again, this is that sliding scale, just like the reasonable bedtime. Start, figure out where you are. Does your child do any physical activity? And if they don't do any physical activity, then you don't want to start running marathons. That would be a crazy thing, right? But you could go for a walk. You absolutely could go for a walk and you could make the walk five minutes longer every day, right? And I do think that, you know, getting them out in the sunshine as long as they can handle that is super important. Of course, you want to use sunscreen. My, our doctor had said to us when my son was little, and I don't think I was very religious about this because I am somebody who cannot be in the sun at all. Now, I have to take a vitamin D supplement because I cannot get vitamin D from the sun. Um, so, uh, you know, I was always very cautious about could my son handle the sun or not. But um, my doctor suggested 10 minutes outside every day without sunscreen just to soak in vitamin D. I, don't, I didn't really follow that, and I don't know that it's the best advice. But I want to say to you, get sunscreen, because I know for sure, even he was saying after 10 minutes, they have to have sunscreen on. Get sunscreen, be outside, be in the fresh air, run them like dogs, come up with excuses for why they have to run, run races, do as much of it with them as you can handle without hurting yourself, because it's good for you too. And I'll tell you what happens when you do this. Self-regulation is so much easier. I know that for our family during the pandemic, we bought a treadmill. And we put it in the middle of our living room where it's still sitting, right? And it hasn't been used a lot lately, but we all had this sort of family meeting the other day and we said, remember during the pandemic when we would all take turns, we were watching Game of Thrones and we would all take turns being on the treadmill while we were watching Game of Thrones. And we all agreed that emotionally we were better, that we felt less of the up and down of life when we were having a little bit of exercise, that burst of energy. And we've heard Dr. Temple Grandin talk about that before, um, that she has to have a burst of exercise every day to keep her in a place where she's productive. I, I think that that is true for most people and everybody's is a little bit different, but think about our kiddos and how much energy they have in them. And if we want them to be happier, we want them to be better at self-regulation, we want their, their moods to be more stable, um, then, and we want them to be able to focus better, this is a key here. Lots and lots of physical activity. Uh, oh, okay, I see a question and then we're going to talk about this in a second. Uh, okay, but lots and lots of, of physical activity and if possible, if you can do it, if the weather permits, I know it's really hot around the country, so you got to be picking your times, whatever. Um, swimming pools, by the way, swimming is a great exercise for our kids. We know that the compression on, of the water against their skin is something that for a lot of young people on the spectrum is a really beneficial thing. And it's a great way for them to exercise and um, not hurt themselves, right? Uh, you can run and end up pulling a muscle. And, and you know, with, with swim, it supports your body, so you can do quite a bit more exercise. That's why they do those senior classes in the pools for seniors, because it's really good for you. Okay, let's move on to number three, which is read with your child every day. Okay, let's talk about the sliding scale of this, wherever, wherever your child is in terms of age and skill level. That if you have a baby, read to them every day. Read to them, right? Sit with them. Like she's, and the picture here, for those of you who are watching, there's a mom uh, or a lady, I don't know that she's the mom, sitting with two babies, and she's reading with the book in front of them. 
Um, so read to babies. If you have a toddler, read with them and have it be interactive and have something on each page. You know, those us born books do this for you, but you can do it with a book all on your own. Every page you find something on the page and say, where's the dog? Or with us born, it's the duck. Where's the duck? And you have them touch it so that they're participating and it becomes interactive. That's with a toddler. Um, then they're, then when they're a little bit older, there's school age books. There's books that we have these great Scooby-Doo books, but I know they make them for lots of different things that, um, they have, they'll do words and then they'll put a picture with a word. And so you can have them read the word because they're looking at the picture. It'll say Scooby walked up to the tree and next to the tree, there's a picture of a tree. And so I would read and I would go, Scooby walked up to the and my son would go tree because he, he's seeing the T-R-E-E, -E, but he's also seeing the picture of the tree and he's associating them together. And this is how you start jumpstarting that reading thing going on, right? Um, then later on, um, you know, you can trade off. Like uh, I, I just had a younger family member visiting and every night we read and I would read one page and then they would read one page and that's how we did it eventually then your child gets older and you just have them read maybe a full chapter and then you you know you have them read till they get tired reading aloud is one of the greatest skills that you can give your child they're going to have to read aloud their entire lives so um, people who can read aloud it helps with confidence with so many different skills so have them read aloud then eventually when you have, if you have a teenager who's reading books and reading them on their own, great. But during the summer, pick a book to read together. Get two copies, have them read it, you read it, and now you guys read and then discuss the chapter, which is what they're gonna be doing in their classes, right? What's great about this is that then you can monitor their comprehension, which is a very difficult thing for our teens and, and difficult for teachers to get at because they don't always have the time. So you're, so sliding scale, but read, 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 read with your child every single day during the summer. I know during the fall, it can be really hard. Your schedule is different. Their schedule is different. Their workload is different at school. I mean, if you can do it every day of the year, do it every day of the year, but during the summer, make it a priority. I'm going to interrupt for just a second because Elizabeth has written in and says, Josh wants to know why using swear words is bad. He says that they're just word, words and he uses it for fun. And Elizabeth, you know, he's not wrong, right? Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why we swear is that most of the swear words have um, sounds, I, you know, X person who taught speech, right? There are fricatives and, that, and that's not a swear word, fricative, um, and stop plosives. So it feels good to say them. And, and that's part of the reason why as adults we swear, right? It's, a, it, it's an expression of something. And I, I don't know how old Josh is, but he's saying, you know, what's the deal? These are just words why can't we use them? Because they're kind of fun to say. I think that every family has different rules and different morals around swear words and what swear words are. I have friends that there are words that everybody uses in the everyday that if that you use them in their presence, it's a swear word to them, right? So first of all, I think as a family, you need to define what words are acceptable to be said and then where they are acceptable to be said. So what? and where and and i think maybe when too you know um i personally made the rule with my son because i knew that when he was a teenager that he was going to be hanging around with friends and that there was they were going to do swear words i just you know I, listen i'm somebody who swears on a regular basis uh <laughs> but here's the deal I understood as a teacher that I could not go in and swear in front of my students. I understand that I'm on the air here and I can't swear on the air here, right? So it becomes about when can I swear, in what context, and, and what words, because there's some words that even I don't say out, you know, when I'm alone, right? That that's, so I would have a discussion about rules and about locations and when things are appropriate. And you can use other examples like, 
um, if he cognitively understands rules and those kinds of things that, for instance, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to pull your pants down when you're in the bathroom by yourself, but it's not acceptable to pull your pants down when you're on a bus or in your classroom, right? That those are rules about what our society will accept and won't accept. So maybe you can talk to him about and set rules about when and where and what words. So we had rules with my son that um, at a certain age, you know, that he was allowed to swear um, at home when nobody else was visiting, that he could swear in front of me. Those were my rules. I'm not saying they have to be your rules, but those were my rules. Um, and that he could swear in front of me, but that if grandma came to visit, no swearing in the house right? And that he could swear, if I picked him up from school, he could get in the car and he could swear the whole way home. Uh, any words he wanted to use, he could just blah, 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 blah. And then when we got out of the car and went into the house, then, you know, uh, that was over and he had to use only specific words, right? And then we changed it as time went on. Uh, but we really instilled in him, there's a time and a place for everything and swearing in the general public, not uh, not acceptable, and then we had to build in his understanding of how people perceive you, right? Because he, he didn't understand that at one point, but then we explained, you know, when people see you do this, they think this about you. And I remember the day that he understood that lesson because he pulled me aside and said, could you please do something about your hair? Because we live in a really windy place and I would show up to pick him up from school and he said to me, sometimes your hair makes you look crazy, mom. <laughs> and he wasn't wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he said, and my friends will think that I have a crazy mom. And I thought, ah, he understands this lesson about what do other people think. He understood that I was not crazy, but my hair would make me look like I was crazy. So we could explain to him, if you swear in these contexts, people think that you don't understand rules. People think that maybe you're not a nice person, and clearly you are a nice person, and you do understand rules. And that was how we explained it to him. Uh, let me know if that all makes sense to you. And if, uh, but you have to meet Josh where he is. But he's not wrong. Swearing is fun. You know. Uh, okay. So let's move on back to our way things to do to prepare for school. But and honestly, that's a thing to prepare for school because we don't swear at school, right? So number four have play dates. This is a really great thing to do in summer because people are more available. And a lot of you will write in and say, Shannon, my child is having trouble having friends. When they're at school, they get bullied. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the things that go into this category. Oh, we need to work on social skills. All of those things um, can be fixed in some portion by having regular play dates. If you can, have it be people that they're going to be in the same class. And I would start with having one person at a time, but then if you have an older kiddo, you can invite a couple of people over at a time. You want to do a couple of things here. You want to think about what it is you're trying, what skill you're trying to build during the play date, because don't think, well, I'm just going to invite people over, we're going to have a play date, and now my child's going to have friends, and they're going to be social. Right? If you're doing ABA, sit down with your team and say, what skills does, do they currently need to work on to be able to have friends? Um, and they might work on some things before the person with the play date get there. For instance, you want to work on being a good loser. You want to work on being a good winner, that you're a good sport, right? You want to work on taking turns. You want to work on sharing. You want to work on um, being able to do what the, ask the other person what they want to do and then follow through on that. Uh, you want to work on what to do when you're frustrated and, and your play date person isn't playing with you, right? All of these different things. But you're not going to try to work on all of them in one play date. This is why you want to set up multiple play dates throughout the summer. And if possible, I, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, you know, we don't have time for play dates because we're constantly doing ABA therapy. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> Like, explain that to me. I don't understand. And they were like, well, we have therapy, and so we can't have play dates. And I was like, why aren't you doing play dates while you have a behavior technician there? 
And, and a lot of times people are telling me this just hasn't occurred to them because ABA has changed and morphed so much that they don't talk about this anymore. This is so critical um, that you want to be making sure that whatever you're doing in your ABA center has legs in the community and your insurance has, there's a code to bill for community outings. And so you set up play dates and have the behavior technician there and then decide beforehand, okay, here's what the two things that we're going to work on during this play date, share it with your child, offer rewards for, you know, what we want to see is really good sharing. And the, and the behavior technician goes, it works like this and gives some correction before the child gets there. Then the child comes and if, the, if your child is able to do good sharing, they get points and then they get a reward at the end of the thing. So you're building a skill during the play date. Don't just willy-nilly have play dates. I mean, you want to work towards that, um, but make sure that you're being clear about what we're trying to accomplish in this play date. Is this not the entire world? Um, and that way you'll, you'll get to the success. If you're doing this, and, and by the way, you can do this with multiple kids in the classroom. Try them on for size. Invite one kid over, do a play date, make it very fun for that kid like have the coolest games to play, have the coolest snacks, right, so that they want to come back again. Look, bribery is fine. I, if that offends you, I, I want to give you a hug and tell you what is it you want out of life. <laughs> Like, like, do you want your kid to be successful? Then bribe other children. Eventually, what it's, it's really a psychological technique called pairing. You're pairing that everything is wonderful at your household with your child. So uh, if you do that enough, then all of a sudden, they're going to be their friend in school, too, and they're going to want to be invited to come back to your house. It works. It works, and it'll help your child. Your child needs a leg up. Um, don't be above bribing um, you know, or, or do it the way you want, but I'm telling you, it works. <laughs> okay. But also, you know, we do, we do want it to transfer to school. So you try one friend on and then invite another person over. And as your child gets older, now have two kids come at the same time. But it can be tricky when there's two kids at the same time because sometimes they will gang up against your child and go, yeah, he's behaving weird right now. So be very careful about that, right? And then eventually you can invite over more kids. When my son was in junior high, we used to do a Friday afternoon at our house where after school on Friday, I would go and it was a maximum of four boys that could come over. And they, I, the house would be set up so that they could play video games and do a live stream that other kids could watch. And I would allow them to throw popcorn. I had every, my husband would come home and he would go to In-N-Out Burger and get them whatever they ordered sometimes. I mean, it was crazy, the lengths that we went to. Sometimes one person would say, well, I want In-N-Out. Another person would say, I want Burger King. And my husband would go to different drive throughs because we wanted them to associate coming to our house as being super fun. By the way, the other parents got in on that eventually and started saying, you can only go to Jem's house on Fridays if your homework is done and your grades are good. And we were all cool with that, right? It became this thing where everybody wanted Friday afternoons because it was really, really cool. And yes, I had to clean up a huge mess on Friday night. My kid was happy. He had friends. I, you know, wh what do you want out of life, right? Um, so have those play dates what, at whatever point is where your child is at. If you have somebody who's not yet started school, start having those play dates now. Um, and, you know... Uh, make that happen for your child. It's not always going to go well, and sometimes you're going to want to hide. Um, I struggled with this until my son got better at it and I got better at it because sometimes the kid would be like, I don't want to come back, right? So prepare yourself, but keep doing the practice. Remember the Grand Canyon. Okay. Uh, number five, make a fall schedule. I love to plan. I love to schedule. I don't think everybody feels that way, but I got to tell you, you're more likely to do things if you set a plan. So I would, at this time of year, I would always pick out, because now by now they have the approved schedule for school for the school year, for this next school year. And I would pull out and I would just do up through the winter break, which is to the end of the year, right? 
And, and I would make a calendar where I would know, okay, school starts on this day, and I would take all of the events that happen at school, like they'll say, when is back to school night? That's probably already been decided by now. When is win uh, fall break? When is um, the Thanksgiving break? When is the holiday break? And I would put all of those on the calendar and anything else that they had to, like any award ceremony, whatever. Then I would sort of look at my community schedule and my personal schedule, and I would put like birthdays and things on it. And you start to have a roadmap. And, and I'll tell you, things are going to come along that are going to change and throw things off. But before I made the schedule, I would miss things like picture day. You know what I mean? I'd be that parent pulling in and everybody's dressed in like the little ties and everything and there's my child in a t-shirt and I'd go, what's happening today? And they're like, oh, didn't you see on the calendar? It's picture day. And by the way, you have to have cash. They don't take a check and they don't take a card because that was the dark ages. Um, you know what I mean? And I hate that. Now, some things are not going to be on the schedule, like picture day may not be on the schedule yet, but you start to fill it in, and then that goes up on the wall someplace. And if you like to keep your house really neat and don't want that kind of clutter, put it on the inside of a cabinet so that it's, you can only see it when you open the cabinet. That way you shut it and nobody, nobody is aware, right? But I'm telling you, you, you will be in the mode of thinking about it, and, and there will be some things you'll see when the breaks are. You can start to plan for when the breaks are. It really will help ratchet down the stress of what's going to happen, right? So set up the things that are really, you can put doctor's appointments on there, uh, dentist appointments. If you have somebody visiting or a place that you have to go, put it anything that's known on the calendar and then you just add to it as you go along. But it will be your roadmap um, to, I, I don't know, I think there's something very healing about seeing, okay, we're going to start here and then we're going to get a break here. Um, that's that's really, really helpful to visually see it. Now, if you prefer to do that on your phone because that's what's responsive for you, do it. But make a schedule so that it's not... I, I have a friend who used to describe it as sometimes they, they would feel like a bug on a lawnmower. <laughs> you know, the lawnmower is going along and grass is coming up and hitting you and you don't have enough time to recoup. You don't want to feel that way. So make yourself a schedule, at least get it started, and see if it doesn't reduce your stress. Number six, this is a good one. Hack your morning routine. I got to pause for a second and say, are any of you watching that show, Hack My House? Oh, it's so terrible. It's so terrible, you guys. I really, like, I want to tell you not to watch it, but I kind of want to tell you to watch it because it's so terrible. This team of four people comes in and families that are having real problems in their house that are too small, that has to function in all these different ways, say, put their trust in these people and they do the craziest things to their house that are so not child safe. It is preposterous. It is the craziest thing. I, I expect there to be lawsuits over this show. It's absolutely insane. But I understand the idea behind it. Like, let's take the space that you're in and the challenges that you have and let's see how we can hack it. How can we possibly make this work in a way that maybe we haven't thought of before? And I think that that's a great thing to do for your morning routine. So if you think about everything that has to happen in the morning and how are you going to do it in the least stressful way? I, I remember when I was single, I once babysat for a family because the, the mom and the dad were going away on a, on a business trip that he had won, but they were going to be gone for, I don't know, like five days. And they had three kids and school had already started. And um, the mom had said, now, you know, for the daughter, every night before she goes to bed, you have to help her lay out all of her clothes. And I remember thinking, this, this lady's crazy crazy like a fox is what that lady was. Um, because if in the morning routine, making decisions and getting dressed is stressful, then we hack it. We get in the habit of before we go to bed at night, she had one of those telescoping um, things on her doorway that it's a, it's a little like a pointer thing, but it's a, you pull it out so it can go away and be flush with the door, but you pull it out and it's a place to hang clothes at night. Brilliant, 
right? And I have one of those little hooks that you can put over the top of the door. Nothing as fancy as the telescoping thing. But, you know, you pick out, okay, what are we wearing tomorrow so that there's we, no hysteria around what's happening. I know when I get stressed now um, at work, I have to lay out my clothes the night before um, for the show because otherwise in the morning I will put on 14 things, which is not productive, you know? So if you have one of those kiddos, maybe you lay out the clothes the night before. I, I also know somebody that their kids take a sack lunch to school every single day. And so on Sunday night, they have this container, this plastic container, where they take out an entire loaf of bread and they make uh, these sandwiches. And the sandwiches go into the Tupperware thing so that every morning one is taken out, it's put into the sandwich baggie, and it goes... I think I would go one step further, further and put them in the sandwich baggie so that you just have to grab and go. But, you know, your hack is your hack. But asking yourself, what do I have to do? I know other people that make and freeze, like Lisa Ackerman. We have a video somewhere uh, that she makes these little egg cups um, for her son when he was in school that it's like grated potato and eggs and sausage and vegan cheese and she bakes it in a muffin cup and they come out and she takes and puts two in a Ziploc bag and freezes them and takes them out the night before breakfast, breakfast on the go, right? Whatever you have to do to think about what would supercharge my morning. I had a roommate once in college that he would set the breakfast table the night before interesting guy. Uh, <laughs> he would set the breakfast table the night before and he would put his cornflakes in the bowl and then he would go to bed. I mean, we ended up with ants in his cereal bowl. So I don't know that that hack was the best, but you know, that was what he felt he needed to do to streamline. Whatever you feel like you need to do, but let's take whatever is stressful in the morning and figure out something else. That's how you hack your morning routine. Even if you have to make a list and go, here's what's stressful in the morning. Like, is packing the backpack stressful in the morning? Is getting the backpack in the car? Could you put the backpack in the car the night before? Is there anything that has to go? I mean, maybe the lunch um, has to go, but, you know, is there a way that you could make that different? Like, maybe the first thing that you do in the morning is you get up and put the lunch in the backpack and you put the backpack in the car and then you come back in the house. Um, and finish the morning routine, but so the backpack is already there and it's not that last minute dash to find the backpack? I don't know, but ask yourself what's the most stressful and if I could make another choice or could do something ahead of time, what could it possibly be? Uh, okay, moving on. Involve your child in back to school shopping, end to end. This is, I think, a really important hack. Because we want to start laying the groundwork right now that school's fun. School's fabulous. School is about you and, and expressing yourself and being cool. So which pencil box do you want? Which shoes do you want? I believe that if you can afford it, and sometimes you can't, right? But having a new pair of shoes and a new, brand new outfit that's never been worn before to wear on the first school of day, and I make a uh, first day of school, and I make a big deal out of it because I want to make school feel special. I also say to my husband, anytime we had to go to any school assembly, I would say to my husband, you have to dress up. And he pushed back for many years. And finally, he said to me, I don't understand. Nobody else dresses up. And I said, because we're letting, this is our signal to him. This is special. When you do something at school, it's special. And then my husband never pushed back after that, right? But it's the same kind of thing when you're doing back to school shopping. And, you know, I mean, not everybody is into back to school supplies and your kid might act like they don't really care. But when you go and say, do you want the Spider-Man notebook or do you want the blue notebook, right? Your child might have an opinion about that. And they might get excited about, oh, I'm going to have a Spider-Man notebook, and that's going to be the notebook that I take to school, which now makes me want to go to school. Grand Canyon, little drips, it all adds up. So have them, plus which we want to be building choices, right? And we can, with even the smallest baby, 
we can stick things in front of them and see which one they gravitate towards. So take your child to the store and have them pick out some of the things. Now, I also think that while you're back to school shopping, there's a couple of other things to note. Um, and I think it's important to do back to school shopping right now for a couple of reasons. All the sales are now. I, it, doesn't, it makes so little sense to me, but all the sales are now. Some teachers are Johnny on it, and you'll go to some, in some communities, you'll go to the local store, and they have lists saying, in Mrs. Williams' class, third grade class, here are the things that we require. I love teachers like that <laughs> because they're thinking and using their noggins. Not everybody has it together. Not everybody has their job right now, right? If you have that, get everything on the list now. You're going to spend less money. But I also want to encourage you to do something else. I, I want you to buy more than one set of everything, if you can afford it. If you can afford it, buy one set for your kid and buy another set and give it to the teacher and say, I went to the sale when it was the sale. I, I'm imagining that there might be a kid or two in your class who can't afford this. Oh my gosh, you want to be on that teacher's side. You want that teacher to think that you're somebody who's going to work with them. Easy peasy. And it might cost you eight bucks if you bought it during the sale. Um, I also think that it's important some teachers will give you a list of things that they want in the classroom um, because teachers have to buy their own supplies a lot of, in a lot of places. Some teachers won't give you that list until back to school night, which look for it when they do that. But during the sale, buy some extra pencils and give them to the teacher. I'll tell you, pencils and Kleenex or tissue, whatever you want to call it, easy. They never have enough of that. So definitely things to do. Um, but involve your child in that. Say to them, what, we want to get something for the teacher. We want to make a, a fun basket or whatever, a bag for the teacher. What shall we get for the teacher? And maybe your child goes in the first night and says, the, you know, or the first day and says, here, this is for you. Oh, now you're building rapport between your child and the student. Talk about setting up for success. Uh, like, let's do that, right? Be a part of a positive thing with the teacher instead of being, you know, oh, it's going to be that parent who's going to ask me all the time for all of this, right? They'll want to work with you if they're a good teacher. Uh, okay, now visit the school. Again, sliding scale. A lot of schools are closed right now, and you can't actually go in the school. That's okay, but I would start driving to the school on a regular basis and don't make this a negative, make this as a, a positive. So you go out for the day and you do whatever and you go to the park and, and, and then you drive by and go, oh, look, it's your school. Look, look what they're doing. Oh, look, you know, do, like they changed the color of this or whatever. Oh, you're going to have so much fun there. You're building it up. Whenever I see kids during the summer and I meet the other people's kids and I'm like, hi, what's your name? How old are you? And I go, Oh, what grade are you in? And they, whatever they say, whatever grade they say, I go, oh, that's the best grade. Because what's the other choice? <laughs> like, don't be like, oh, no, you're going to hate eighth grade. Oh, third grade, that's the worst. That's where you have to learn how to write. Let's not put that on them. Let's make it exciting. Oh, my gosh, third grade is the best. Do you know who your teacher is? Oh, oh, I'll bet she's great. Do you, have you ever met her before? Oh, I'll bet she's wonderful. She's going to love you. Sell it, folks sell it but visit the school now if you right now you probably can't get into the school but write to somebody on the team and say when could we come and take a tour of the school especially if they've never been in the school before and if they've never been in the school before and they'll let you come in and they might not let you come in until the day before but that's fine go in the day before walk the path of everything that your child will have to do so that it's not a big surprise have you ever been in, in a situation where you're going to start a new job or when you went to college or graduate school and you were like nervous about it? And if you had had the opportunity to see it all beforehand so you could picture yourself, what would that do to the stress level? It would probably bring it down. Let's give that gift to our, our, the, the people that we love on the spectrum, right? Uh, especially in the older grades and especially when it's a new school, take the time to walk and do it. But if it's a school that they've already been to before, try to see if you can get in and just see where their new classroom is. Uh, 
Sometimes they'll do something the night before school, like uh, one of Jem's schools used to do an ice cream social the night before where they would all come in, they would sit at the desk that they were going to be at, the, the room would be decorated, and everybody would get to have ice cream except my child who didn't eat ice cream, okay, but it was a good thing. Make sure that if you can get in, get in. Um, I loved in junior high, we went and walked the entire thing, and that was the day that his counselor gave him the card that said, if you ever need anything, this is your get out of jail free card. You just show this to a teacher and they have to let you come to me right away. Ratchet in that stress down. Visit the school, sell it, make it seem like a good thing. You won't, it's time well spent, you guys. It sets them up for success and it will reduce their fear. Okay, number nine. This is one of the things that you're going to do for yourself, for your child, and your teacher and anybody else that is going to interact with your child. You're going to take the existing IEP that you have and the existing BIP, right? And you are going to laminate those. And I know some people, what they do because they don't have a laminator is that they get just a sheet protector. Um, and they put magnets on the back of the sheet protector and they stick the... IEP with the BIP. Some people, if the BIP is really critical, um, because it's happening a lot, the thing that has to be intervened on, the behavior intervention plan, they'll make a separate one for that, but they stick magnets on it so that the teacher, and then give them to the teacher and anybody who interacts with your child. Um, and you put the magnets there so that they can attach it to the side of a file cabinet or something, because this does a couple of things. First of all, you know where your IEP and your BIP is, which you should know where it is at all times. I'm going to be honest and say that sometimes I would lose track of where mine was. You know what I'm saying? But it's best for your stress level if you know exactly where those pieces of paper are if you ever need them. Um, but it also means that you're giving it to the teacher and the teacher's aide or the aide or the vice principal or the phys ed teacher, the speech teacher, whatever. So it, it is a notice to all of them. They probably were supposed to already have it, but if, let's guess whether they know where it is and how many students they have with an IEP, right? But you're saying, this is important. I want to make sure that you have it, and I've taken the time to do it in a way so that you can have it out if you choose to. Some will choose to, some won't. But you're also sending a message saying, my child has an IEP, my child has a BIP, and I am on the job. And I'm going to work with you like a professional on your team, and I'm going to expect you to be professional. Um, it is not threatening in any way, but it's very proactive saying, hey, we're all going to do this together. That is a legally binding document. And you don't want to be in a situation where something happens to your child and somebody says, I wasn't aware. It would still be the school's fault if somebody said that, but let's not, let's not have that happen. Let's make sure that we've given them every opportunity to be as up to speed on what's going on with your child as possible. It's going to quiet your stomach too because you're going to go, I have done everything that I can to, to make this IEP, my individual education plan for my child, as tight as it can possibly be. I've done everything to include a, a, a really person-centric specific to my child, humane behavior intervention plan so that my child doesn't get hurt, right? But that they're not allowing behavior that shouldn't be happening to happen, right? But I, and I've also gone the extra mile to make sure that everybody on the team has a copy in a way that is durable. Because you can't, there's not much more that you can do unless you're Elastigirl. And none of us are Elastigirl. You know what I'm saying? So, Make those copies and put them in sheet protectors or laminate them, whatever you got to do. Sends a message to everybody that you're on the job. And then the last one on our list of things to do is probably the most fun, but I think it's critical. Do tongue twisters with your kids. Now, you can Google, you can Pinterest, look up tongue twisters. They're super duper fun. Why? Well, most of our kids have, if your child has an autism a specific autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, then they have a language disability. They are not able to communicate. What that actually is saying is that they are not able to communicate in a way uh, without support. Now, the, the level of, you know, where they could be on that continuum is, 
immense, right? More than we could possibly talk about this week. But um, what we know is that for most school-aged individuals on the autism spectrum, that language developed at least late. And um, even if your child is currently nonverbal, you can still attempt tongue twisters, right? Um, sometimes we do them and it's just the, a movement with the tongue and, and then we can try to add sound. So you wanna start again on that sliding scale of wherever they are, but one of the things that we find is that our kids start to get language more often than not. They start to acquire language, but because the facial muscles are behind their typical peers, they have even that much more to overcome. So what we see are kids who are attempting to communicate and are not being understood. Oh, the level of frustration on everyone's part when that happens. Uh, my son, uh, this was certainly the case, and again, I'm somebody who taught voice and diction to college students um, and speech. So, uh, you know, but we were behind and we were having to catch up on a lot of oral motor things. But my son would say things and people wouldn't understand him, which would make him less want to communicate than more communicate. So um, I've learned, and if I had it to do over again, I would have implemented tongue twisters much earlier than we did. Um, but I've learned with other members of our friends and family that with all kids, all kids, why wouldn't we do tongue twisters? They're fun, they build that oral motor, they help them to communicate at whatever level that they are. So it can be as simple as if you've got a young child that is nonverbal, uh, it can be as simple as taking some sort of substance like applesauce or pudding and putting it around their lips and then you doing the same thing and you licking it off, which improves the tongue muscles. That's a great thing to do. But then we can start making sounds like ba 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 and pa 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 pa, and we can build up from there. Uh, I, I find that once they're in school age and once they understand the tongue twisters, it's kind of fun saying rubber baby buggy bumpers, right? And I usually have a list of like 10, but you know, this is what I taught. But you can go on any website and you can, you know, look up tongue twisters and, and ask the speech teacher working with your child, what sounds are we most working on? Like they might say you're working on the L sound. And so you can type in what are L sound tongue twisters, right? Um, but you'll find that your kiddo will have favorite ones. And what we do in my house, when we're on a car trip, we sing and we do tongue twisters. And you know, we go around the car and everybody gets to pick one and then everybody has to do it, right? So, uh, and, and you can make them longer so you're working on working memory too. A lot of them love, uh, one of the things that they love in our car is, what to do to die today at a minute or two till two, a thing distinctly hard to say, but harder still to do. For they'll beat a tattoo at a 20 till two, a rat -a -ta 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 tattoo and the dragon will come when he hears the drum at a minute or two till two today at a minute or two till two. And we will work on that and, until they can memorize it, working memory. And then we will work on being able to do it on one breath so that they're working on breath support too. So um, all different kinds of things that you can do. And if you have specific questions, if you're not sure, you can write to me and I'll help match a tongue twister to your kid's abilities. But your speech teacher, your speech and language pathologist probably has them too. Lots of things that you can do there. And when you work on tongue twisters, you're helping them to communicate and be ready to communicate. Um, so really, really a, a great, fun thing to do during the summer. Okay, I hope that something that we talked about was useful. Use whatever you can and disregard the rest. Throw the rest in the circular trash file. It's all good, all okay and good for us because it's not one size fits all. But I will tell you, that what you decide to do from now until the first day of school has the potential to set your child up for great success. None of the things that we've talked about are particularly hard or time consuming and they should, you should make it fun for all of them. So I hope that you will do as many of them as you possibly can. I am picturing you guys having a good, fun summer. 
Here's what's happening the rest of this week. Tomorrow we're going to be playing a Stories from the Spectrum and that will be a rerun. But then on Friday, we are going to have our newest edition of Let's Talk Movies, where we talk about some of the different movies that are out right now in summer uh, that we loved, that we hated. Uh, Moira Giamatteo will be here with me. We're also going to be getting an update from her about what's going on with Taka. If you don't know, they are already selling tickets for their fall conference. This is a conference that will be in person for the first time in a very, very long time. Although there is a virtual ticket that you can buy. And when you buy the virtual ticket, when you buy either case, if you buy the in-person or the virtual, you have access to all of the videos of all of the talks, I believe, until the end of the year. Um, that's usually how it ends, that I think on New Year's Eve it disappears and goes away. But it's a very low cost and, you know, Temple Grandin is the keynote speaker, so you got to love that, right? Um, but there are three or four different tracks about all different things. I am one of the speakers um, that I will be there in person with Temple Grandin and a whole lot of other people. So. It's going to be a good time. If you can attend that conference, come to that conference. I don't get to conferences very much anymore since the pandemic. Well, there weren't very many, right? But every once in a while I go and I'm going to be there at least two of the three days. I probably will be there the third day as well. Um, but my talk is on Friday morning. So I'm there definitely Friday and Saturday. Temple is talking on Saturday. And I don't, I don't know if I'll be there Saturday night and Sunday morning, but I'm going to try to make it work. It's the weekend before our All Ghouls Gala, so I don't know whether I have to get back or not. But in any case, I hope that you'll check that out. You can go to TACANow.org to find out more about that. I also want to plug, if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, oh my goodness, on September 9th, the Ed Asner Family Center is having an amazing concert that I, I, I can't even uh, remember all of the superstars that they have playing at this one concert Ubastank, um, <laughs> just saying that name is hilarious to me. Ubastank is going to be performing. Ringo is going to be there and performing with his all-star band. Colin Hay will be there. So many other people. I'm forgetting all of them. Matt will never forgive me. But you can buy your tickets now. And it's an amazing opportunity to see an all-star lineup, and it benefits the Ed Asner Family Center. Oh, you know who else is going to be there? Toto. And do you know who's going to be playing the drums for them? Logan Shepard. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you didn't have enough reasons to go to that, you need to get yourself uh, tickets. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, it's not to be missed, and the tickets are really reasonable. I've been trying to go to more live concerts and things, and I can't believe how much tickets are. These tickets are really reasonable. So get them while they're there. It will sell out. All right, we're out of time, but thank you so much for being here with me. I hope you have uh, a great rest of the week, and make sure that you check us out on Friday morning, Let's Talk Movies with Moira and Shannon. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.